five monthly reports in Design Manager. And we're going to be discussing these five accounting reports, or also known as subsidiary journals, that are critical into um, maintaining the proper picture of health of your company. And um, we're going to be using examples both in our Design Manager and our Design Manager Professional, as we always do on our Thursday webinars. So if you'd like to see uh, the report or the functions that we go through to get things uh, transactions on and off the report in one platform or the other, just ask at one of the many question periods that we'll have today. Now these five classic accounting reports in Design Manager's accrual model provide great insight and analytic assistance in monitoring the overall health of your company, proactively spotting accounting or fiscal issues, ensuring the proper flow of business through the company, and they are as follows. First, the open client deposit report, open vendor deposit report, accounts payable, aged accounts payable, work in process, and finally, the aged accounts receivable reports. Now, we recommend reviewing these reports, as we said, on a monthly basis, at a minimum, to ensure that the, the financial aspect of your company is being run as effectively as possible. And all of these reports uh, also reflect activity on the financial statements, the balance sheet, and the income statement. So as we go through our discussion today, we'll monitor those reports as well and see how um, changing one of the five reports affects either the balance sheet and or the income statement. We're going to go through each report today, how transactions appear on them, uh, how transactions naturally drop off them, and in a similar vein, how to get invalid transactions off of the report. And I'm going to present the reports in the natural uh, design flow in the order that transactions originally appear on them. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> let's begin with our open client deposit report, which is located on our accounts receivable reports under open client deposit. Now, the open client deposit report displays deposits on proposals and retainers that you have recorded from your client but have not yet applied on a client invoice. It will also show client invoices that utilize a retainer or deposit that just has not done so in full. It's also used as a physical representation of the activity that's currently held in the client deposit liability account. If we look at our balance sheet, which I'm going to put on my favorite reports, because we'll be going to it many times today. We can see under our liabilities, our client deposit account and its current balance. Now, all deposits and retainers are held in this client deposit account and it is a liability at this stage in accrual, um, accrual accounting because technically these funds still belong to the respective clients until they get utilized on a client invoice which represents the transfer of ownerships of the goods and services. So let's take a look at the client port itself. And by default, we can run the report for all of our projects, but in cases where I'm trying to review information on a single project or a group of projects, I can narrow it down with the project range, but for our presentations today, I'm going to run the reports in their entirety. Okay, now here we go. This is our client open repository report, the detail version indicating that I'm going to show every transaction, not just a single line for my projects. And let's take a look at what we see here. First, we have our Carter's Pennington Home Project, and they have a retainer of $5,000. Their Brigantine Beach Home has a retainer of $2,000, and a deposit on two different per uh, proposals. First, we have a deposit on Proposal 1 for $26.58 and change, and a second deposit on Proposal 2 for $23.40. Now we can see here that I have actually used a portion 
of this deposit. And there's going to be a balance due or a remaining deposit on that proposal. Let's take a look. If we look at our proposal status, we can see that not all of the items have been invoiced. All the ones listed in black are invoiced in full, but we still have our arrow route down here listed in red, which is the final application or the remaining balance of our original 2340. Our Hilson project also has a single deposit on a proposal. So the report again shows us retainers and deposits we receive that are not yet fully applied on our invoices. So if we add a retainer, let's say to our Hilson project, back on our documents and accounting, we'll add a retainer for Hilson, and let's say it's $2,500. Check number 45. I'm going to input my $2,500 second retainer. Deposit, smash my receipt, hit OK. There's our retainer, and now If we look at the report again, we'll see that we have another retainer line for the Hilson project. And my current balance has increased from 17,066 to 20,162, which is also reflected on our balance sheet. So my liability client deposit account has increased accordingly. So, very simply, easy to get information on here. As soon as we record a retainer or deposit, it's going to go into our open client deposit report and to our corresponding account. How do transactions naturally come off of here? Well, okay, most generally they come off by creating a client invoice. So if we make an invoice for, let's say, the remaining error route for our uh, Brigantine Beach home, Okay, that's our arrow route. That transaction is now going to fall off of the report. If we use another pro project, let's take our Carter Pennington home, we could use a retainer also for the remainder of our window treatment. See, we're using our retainer to take off the balance. We see that our invoice balance due is zero. Now let's take a look at the report. And we can see we've used a portion of our um, retainer, reducing the amount both on our Pennington home and our Brigantine Beach home. And all of that is also reflected on the balance sheet. Let's take a little bit further here. So as transactions naturally fall off the report when we're invoicing, we may find transactions that simply appear incorrect. Now, if we look at the Hilson deposit, we can see this 8323 is all the way back from March of 2013. That indicates to me, if we look back at our documents and accounting,
we can see that the proposal amount itself was 83,023 and we actually received the same amount. Here is one of the common pitfalls on the open client deposit report. When I got the funds in from the Hilsons, I applied the entire amount as a deposit, which is fine. However, it's still the act of going through making the client invoice that will allow it to drop off. So I have an entry all the way back from 2013 that I need to remove from this report. To do so, again, I make a client invoice. Now, what are my considerations here? Quite honestly, I should have invoiced this at the end of 2013. Since I've already paid my income taxes on 2013, I certainly don't want to affect those, um, those books, those fixed upon transactions. So I need to make an invoice to remove this deposit in 2014. Let's do so. Under our Hilson client invoice, select all of our wine cellar and we can see our deposit matches the entire amount due for a balance due of zero. I could put this in to today's date which is fine. Again, I have a balance due of zero, accepting, and now the Helsons will drop as well. But here are the considerations upon those old transactions. As we can see, our Hilson 8323 is now gone. What just happened there? Well, one, I have now uh, generated net income into 2014, of which I'll be taxed upon at the, end of, uh, the beginning of next year. Further, I now have sales tax due upon that invoice, which really should have been taken care of last year. So when I'm removing old tra transactions off of the open client deposit report, I need to be cognizant that I am uh, accruing some net income, which I'll be taxed upon uh, for my 2014 taxes. I'm now liable for the sales tax as well, all of which should have been taken care of in 2013. So that's why we need to ensure that we're looking at this report to make sure we're invoicing our clients done in a timely manner, make sure that they're properly using um, the client's funds. In other words, if I have funds from the client that are on here for quite a while, I either need to use them on an invoice or perhaps indeed I need to return those funds um, as well. So the open client deposit report catches monies hanging out that should be invoiced to the client or should be returned. And all this needs to get done as one of our monthly reports. Liz, I'm going to pause for questions between each of the reports today. Do we have any right now? Brad, we do not have any questions right now, so I think we're good to move forward. Great. I'm going to close out some of our reports here. Get us back on track. Okay. Next, our second of our five monthly reports is going to be our open vendor deposit report. In the natural design process, you know, once we get our deposits and retainers in from the client, the next phase is generally to start making purchase orders and, if necessary, send accompanying vendor deposits. The vendor deposit is uh, an initial fund required by the vendor for them in, um, to begin processing the order. And the open vendor deposit report shows all the vendor deposits on a project or inventory purchase order that has not yet been applied to a vendor invoice. In other words, we may, uh, the vendor may request a 50% deposit for us. We create that as a vendor deposit transaction in Design Manager, and it will get utilized or applied on a vendor invoice, which will then drop it off of the report. The report will also show the, these vendor invoice transactions that have not utilized the entire deposit. So you might see transactions that have partial vendor deposits remaining on them. Moreover, this report re represents the activity that's going to be uh, recorded in the vendor deposit asset account. And if we look at our balance sheet, we can see under our assets is our vendor deposits. <clears throat> vendor deposits are held in an asset account because the goods and services still technically belong to the vendor, but the cash technically belongs to us. We can retrieve that cash at any time, depending if the order goes awry. 
only upon receiving the vendor invoice does the um, does the goods become our, our our own, and the vendor invoice represents the transfer of ownership from the vendor to us. So we're going to move the activity from the vendor deposit out into either work in process or cost of goods sold. So let's take a look at our vendor deposit report, which is under accounts payable. And let's use the professional platform in this case to give our professional version uh, attendees today. Accounts payable, open vendor deposit. All right, now, open vendor deposits. Let's see what we have here. For both curtain calls, legacy antiques, and Philip Jeffries, we all have deposits on purchase orders that have not yet been applied on vendor invoices. Legacy Antiques further has a deposit that has been partially applied. We can see we entered a $1,900 deposit, but utilized $1,100 of that uh, for a partial vendor invoice. To get transactions on here, like I said, we would create new vendor deposit transactions. Let's say we're going to add one for one of our existing purchase orders for our Carter's Brigantine Beach Home. Philip Jeffries, invoice date, great. Pay with check is just fine. And we'll do $208. If we go ahead and post this, we can see We now have a second entry for Philip Jeffries for $208, and correspondingly, our balance sheet will also reflect an increase in that open client, uh, open vendor deposit asset account. So anytime we make a vendor deposit, it's going to go onto the open vendor deposit report, and in turn increase our open our vendor deposit asset account. So how do transactions come off of here? Well, like I said, we need to process a vendor invoice that utilizes that deposit. So let's go ahead and say we would get our final payment on our uh, CAR01 uh, PO7, and that bill finally comes in. In this case, we're going to be doing an invoice on a project PO. All right, there's our legacy antiques. We'll just use the PO number as the invoice number. Today's date is just fine. Final payment on PO. And we can see I've already paid for the French dining room table and its corresponding freight. Now I'm paying for the side chairs and its freight. Design Manager even reflects the fact that I do have the $800 remaining, which absolutely matches the difference between my original deposit and the deposit I have left. If we click OK, Design Manager is warning me, which is just fine. Go ahead and post. And now, if we look at our vendor deposit report, we can see that my legacy antiques now only has the 2400 as we fully utilized. Oops. There we go. We fully utilized the entire 1900 on our um, Brigantine, our Pennington Homes purchase order number seven. So as soon as we use the vendor deposit on a vendor invoice, it will naturally drop off the report. So let's think about some of our errant or problem transactions, and why would they be uh, undesirable? Well, for one thing, if we're maintaining vendor deposit transactions on this report for a great amount of time, for one, and very importantly, we're overstating the value of the company. And why are we doing so? Well. 
This activity, as we said, is going to be stored in the vendor deposit asset account on our balance sheet. We need, if the goods and services have already been invoiced to the client, we need to move this off of vendor deposit into cost of goods sold. We need to, otherwise we have all of our revenue from our client invoice, but we no longer have not yet accrued our cost of goods sold. So it looks like we have made far more money on this merchandise than we really have. So we're overstating our net income, and which is um, less than ideal when it comes tax time next year. Further, if these goods, if we have uh, old transactions on here, and we have indeed sent the vendor a check or a credit card payment, well, we're either, we're required some sort of recompensation. We either still have the money with the vendor, or they owe us a return or a credit in it for future purchases. So it's very important to timely review this report to ensure that our funds are being utilized by the vendor appropriately. Let's take a look at this final transaction for Legacy Antiques. Again, we can see this one is dated all the way from March of last year. If we review it a little farther, let's go to our purchase order window for our Hilson project. Here is our purchase order, and we can see this is an immediate red flag to me. I can see that my purchase order amount, my total estimated cost, matches my deposit sent perfectly. This, this immediately alerts me that someone has, rather than recording this pro forma or 100% payment as a vendor invoice, they have put it as a vendor deposit. I still need to process a vendor invoice to remove this activity out of our vendor deposits and get it into cost of goods sold. So let's go ahead and do so. We we'll go back to our accounts payable vendor invoices. We'd add another invoice on project PO. Oops. And we can see here's our legacy antiques. We're going to move our activity. Today's date is just fine. And we can see our cost on invoice is 2,400, and there's our entire deposit amount. Again, we're not we're not accruing any cost either into our project or more importantly into our income statement. We're holding all this as a as an asset account. Okay, post. Now we can see that transaction is gone off of our vendor deposit report. And just as importantly, our vendor deposit account has decreased substantially. We can even see that's our old entry from last year. And finally, we've now moved this vendor deposit asset across the border into our income statement accounts. And we now have a corresponding increase. There's our $1,600 of uh, merchandise and $200 of freight. We see our increase in cost of goods sold. This technically should have been done last year, and I am right now paying for revenue or a total net income that I did not actually generate. So considerations here are, one, I, I am posting the vendor invoice and reducing that, uh, lie, that asset, and I am increasing my cost of goods sold. So for this year, I am actually reducing my total net income, which may be fine. <clears throat> Further, I am also processing through these older transactions, so my profitability on each of the projects will change to do so. So that's why the Open Vendor Deposit Report is one of our five monthly reports. It's very, very critical that we ensure that orders are being properly filled by the vendor, and more importantly, that we're accurately recording our cost of goods sold. If we leave activity hanging out in our Open Client Deposit account, 
we're really hurting ourselves financially by being taxed upon income that truly isn't there. Open vendor deposit report, very, very important. Liz, I'll pause again at this point to see if there's any questions on the open vendor deposit report, and then I'll continue to move forward. Brad, there are no questions on this report, so I think we're good. Okay, tremendous. How about we switch back to our design manager, and now we'll go to our next report. So after we uh, send our deposits to our vendors, they're going to begin processing our orders, and well, guess what? They'll be sending us our final bill. So when we enter vendor deposits, vendor invoices, or even the operating expenses necessary to run the business, this activity will first move into the accounts um, payable liability account, provided they were not uh, charged to a credit card as, we, as they await final payment via check, uh, debit card, online payment, etc. We can review all of this activity on our aged accounts payable report. Now, the aged account, the accounts payable account is a liability account, much like the open client deposit account. Because the company, of course, is required to remit payment on all of these uh, transactions to alleviate the debt at some point in the future. So let's take a look at our balance sheet again. And we can see our first entry is our accounts payable account. These are mon this is monies that we owe our vendors. Now, the H accounts payable report tends not to have as many overlooked and outdated transactions lingering on it as uh, perhaps some of the others we've discussed or will discuss because your vendors tend to let you know uh, politely or not so politely that you owe them money. That being said though, monitoring this report will keep, um, will keep you, will allow you to have a better perspective of your overall cash flow status of the company because you're going to be cognizant of these debts that will ultimately reduce your cash checking balances. So you can foresee whether or not um, you have enough cash coming in, cash balance to pay these transactions, etc. Ideally, the, uh, the accounts payable account and our aged accounts payable report match precisely, and further, they will match all of the transactions listed on our checking window pay print tab. So all three of those are ideally in synchronous date. So let's take a look at the report and see what it tells us. Well, first we can see we have a couple operating expenses, one for Federal Express and a couple down here for my Princeton Real Estate Group, which I imagine is for my rent. I also have vendor invoices on project purchase orders for American Express, Baker Nap Nap and Tubs, and Century Furniture, all awaiting payment. The entry for Baker, in fact, I've actually recorded a partial payment. Apparently, I paid half of this already and uh, will be remitting payment on the remainder at some point in the near future. How does information get on this report? Very simple. Anytime we input any kind of bill into Design Manager, it doesn't matter if it's a deposit uh, or invoice on a project or inventory purchase order or if it's an operating expense or what have you, provided we don't pay it immediately with a credit card or use the hand check function, it'll first go into the accounts payable report. Let's take a look. Let's say we have to pay uh, our energy bill, for example, from NRG Energy. Let's say this was March 2014. Monthly energy. I already have my gas and electric uh, account attached to my NGR energy vendor, so that's easy for me to remember. And let's just say it was 150 last month. I go ahead and hit OK here. There's our vendor invoice, our operating expense for, for our energy bill. And now we can see 
that our aged accounts payable has a new entry for our energy bill. We also see that our checking window now has an entry for NRG energy waiting to be paid. And lastly, that our balance sheet also reflects an increase in the accounts payable. From, oops, from 5560 to 5710. So again, all of those three areas in the software are perfectly uh, synchronized. So getting information on there is very easy. Getting information off actually is just as easy. For example, say that we are going to pay oh, our FedEx charge via a credit card. So I go, I go on to my American Express uh, web page or I go on to my FedEx web page and I pay it through my American Express card. I hit OK here. I have my payment list. I print out for my records, I close, and I accept, boom, FedEx has dropped from my pay bills print checks and has moved over to my credit card activity tab listed as a charge. Now, let's take a look. Back on our accounts payable report, FedEx has now dropped. What I find more interesting is if we look at our balance sheet, we now see a movement out of our accounts payable, which has decreased, to our American Express, which has increased. So essentially, we have moved the liability from accounts payable over to our American Express. We're just really shifting the, uh, the debt from our company over to what we've now know American Express. Let's take another look. If we go ahead and pay uh, Say we pay our Princeton real estate via check. Here's my check form. I'm using the middle check format, so I have stub at the top, stub at the bottom, check in the middle. I print my actual check form from Nelco into the device, print that guy out, close, and accept we see now Princeton has dropped off and is reflected in our checkbook, which again corresponds to our AP report. Princeton, one of the transactions has been removed. And again, what I find interesting is that on our balance sheet, we can see that our accounts payable has been reduced, but so has our cash. So really, we removed a bit of our liabilities by reducing our assets. So all of this information ties and flows through the business appropriately. I'm paying off some debt, and to do so, I have to reduce one of my assets. So now, <clears throat> why are transactions um, on the aged accounts payable report technically bad, or should they be concerning? Well, often, most commonly, I find is that there are duplicate transactions um, on the aged AP report, and that is understating your net income. In other words, you're representing more expenses or cost of goods sold than your company truly has accrued. And um, further, and more conventionally, bills that have uh, been unpaid for long periods of time can obviously affect your company credit. And it's a really big marker against the strength of your company if you ever get your company um, evaluated or appraised for sale or transfer or for loans. 
So you always want to keep your accounts payable as tidy and as timely as possible. Let's take a look back here. Recall we just made a check for Princeton Real Estate Group. But I still have another operating expense for the same month's rent for Princeton Real Estate Group. In other words, I have a duplicate transaction. What this is doing is increasing or overstating expenses that I have um, that I have entered. So I need to remove or get rid of this duplicate. Very easy. I can use my go to button. Here we go. We can see I have an April 2014 twice. Someone entered it once and someone else came along and entered it a second time. The first one is already paid for, so that's valid. I need to remove the duplicate by simply voiding. Which is fine, but doing so again, I have now increased my net income by 1500 So if I have several of these transactions that may be on this report for years and years, and as I'm quote unquote cleaning it up, I could be affecting my 2014 finances quote unquote negatively because my net income is going to be exaggerated for fictional transactions that I recorded years back and had yet to um, properly handle. So again, that's why this report is on our uh, five monthly reports because we want to make sure that we are properly paying our vendors in a timely method uh, and uh, making sure we don't have any duplicate or errant transactions. Liz, any questions on the aged accounts payable report? No, Brad, we have no unanswered questions on that one, so I think we're good. Fantastic. Okay, now that's going to move us over to our fourth of our five monthly reports, and this is our work in process report. When we receive and record an invoice or bill from the vendor, by default, Design Manager is going to take the cost of those goods or services and place that activity first into the work in process asset account. Let's take a look at our balance sheet. There it is. And uh, the activity is going to remain in work in process until we invoice our client for that good or service. At that point, the cost um, is going to get relieved from work in process and move into our cost of goods sold. So really, the client invoice, in effect, represents the transfer of ownership from your company to the client and actually acts as a physical manifestation of that transaction. Now, the work in process is an asset account because technically, 